Hello and welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, and this is our first show. So what's the idea behind the show? Well, regardless of the segment you operate in from automotive to medical or industrial to white goods, there is information aplenty. Every supplier has a website, data sheets, application notes, tools, and development boards. The challenge is sorting through all this information to find the pieces relevant to your application. And even if you do discover the relevant pieces, not all of them make sense or functions described as you start prototyping. Now, a lot of our engineering audience will work for large organizations. And if that is the case, there are probably plenty of colleagues to turn to. There you'll find a wealth of experience and ideas as to how to resolve the challenge you face. However, there are others in smaller teams or working alone. If no one in the team has seen the issue before or attempted to implement the function or feature desired, you end up a little stuck. And while many suppliers provide excellent support, it can be lacking with others. So where do you turn to next? Well, exhibitions are a great way for small and medium-sized businesses to speak directly with component, tool and system suppliers. Often their team of application engineers is on the stand at the exhibition and happy to chew the fat regarding engineering difficulties. However, the world is still gripped by COVID. Even if exhibitions and in-person events recovered this year, many employers may still have travel instructions in place. Furthermore, we have no idea how this global pandemic will develop in the months to come. So we have to assume that unfortunately, there is a chance that our favorite exhibitions and congresses may not happen. Well, not in person, where the value is for many visitors. So where does Elector come in? Well, during the pandemic, we ran our Elector Helps campaign, supporting businesses to get the word out when alternative op options were restricted. Also, through our articles focused on industry topics, we've reported on what's been going on to keep the engineering community informed. This has ranged from the engineering and maker response to the COVID pandemic, to the semiconductor crisis and the availability of the chips you so desperately need. To broaden our reach, we've decided to launch this show, the Elector Engineering Insights, to provide an alternative medium through which we can connect engineering professionals. Going live on Wednesdays around once per month, we're going to be inviting experts from different fields to discuss a range of challenges around everything from embedded system development and power supply design to wide band gap technologies and IoT. To ensure that your voice is part of what's going on, join us in the conversation. You can join in with questions during our live shows. We're streaming on LinkedIn, Twitter, and also on the Elector TV channel on YouTube. So regardless of where you're watching, you can post your questions and comments, and we'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. Between the shows, you can also get in touch with me, Stuart Cording, directly via email or Twitter. And if you'd like to learn what topics we'll be covering in the future, then and who's going to be joining with us, then look at when the show streams are going to take place on our dedicated page at the Elector Engineering Insights site, where you can find it all at ttcr.at slash EEI. So with that, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, CJ Abate, who's our technical content director, and add him here into the conversation. Hi, CJ. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm very well, very excited, and enjoying my first uh, five minutes of the show. Yeah, it's been it's great. I was thinking today, um, I believe it was two or three years ago, I was in a coffee shop here in the US talking to you on Skype about the possibility of maybe a podcast or a live stream or something. And We've had the idea going back and forth a bit over the last two or three years, and now here we are. So this is great. Yeah, it um, comes full circle. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to our audience and, and get some information about your background first. Um, you know, Electro readers all over the world know you, uh, but some of the people on YouTube might not. So why don't you tell us a bit about uh, your background? Yeah, so I grew up in the UK and I always had an interest in electronics. Uh, I grew up with a Commodore 64. We talked a little bit about that as we uh, did the 60th uh, anniversary magazine for Elector recently. And uh, yep, you got a copy right here. there. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> and I think like many um, 
children of the 70s and 80s, we grew up with those 8-bit machines at home. And that was our introduction to programming and also into electronics. It was not just about writing programs for that machine. It was also about connecting sensors to them and out putting and controlling things as well. So it gave you that overall view of, of what electronics was about. Uh, later, I went to university and studied electronics. And as part of my degree, I spent one year here in Germany, where I live today in Munich, working for National Semiconductor, working on the development and design and testing of new microcontrollers. So my, my career sort of path was, was set with that. And the more time I spent in the electronics industry, I worked my way around at various different uh, semiconductor vendors over the years. Um, I was often employed in, in field roles, which means you go out to customers. So I spent a lot of time going to white goods manufacturers and people manufacturing automotive uh, engine management units or electronic control units. And through those experiences, you spend a lot of time with engineers and you see the challenges they face on a day-to-day -day basis. You understand what sort of information they're looking for and where the struggle is in going from we have an idea to what components and solutions and software is available on the market to how do we actually then get all this working together as a as a as a complete system so that so we yeah. can actually fulfill our target, which is which is bringing the product to market. I think that's really going to be a focus for this show of yours. You know, we have a couple of other shows coming out. Uh, soon uh, on YouTube and, and Twitter and, and LinkedIn. Um, our lab team will be doing a show with kind of DIY tutorial type stuff. But with you, there's a bit of a focus on an engineering problem and a solution with an expert, correct? Or maybe two experts. Yeah, exactly. So one of my stops on the journey to moving more into this sort of journalism role was working for microchip technology and there i worked as a uh, technical trainer and every week we would run maybe three four different classes on on programming topics around microcontrollers it went everything from from basic 8-bit microcontrollers to the 32-bit machines and then we also showed particular specific application implementation. So how do I create a USB-based device or yeah. connect over Ethernet, control a motor, and so on. And what surprised me was not that there was interest in having that deep technical hands-on training uh, over several days, which people came along to. It wasn't very expensive, so it was a very minimal barrier to entry. What surprised me was that the number of engineers that came along merely to ask a question they saw that you know they saw a, a course yeah it's interesting for me but i don't necessarily need to know that now but i would like to go there and ask somebody something very specific about how the compiler works or understand how this microcontroller feature is implemented um, because i'm struggling i have problems with it people would often just bring a complete system with them in a box it's a carpet yeah. box comes out all the wires or the boards and we'd sit there and analyze that and for me, this show is a lot going to be a lot about bringing professional engineers in, in um, together to talk about these these challenges. We're going to have um, normally two or three guests from different from different companies uh, who have a, a, an expertise in a particular area, and we're going to be asking them about you know what's the state of play today, what's um, what's the latest technology, which direction are things are going, but also what are the technical challenges when trying to say connect a display to a microcontroller or um, how how do I you know move from uh, silicon MOSFET technology to silicon carbide or GAN in order to do uh, power converters and um, yeah. learn from them and, and find out what's going on in order to let people move forward more quickly. I think it's great. I mean, we have a web page set up for this and, and uh viewers can read some of your articles there, but also they can use the Electra website to get in contact with you. Uh, yeah. Maybe submit some questions uh, ahead of time uh, before your upcoming shows. So on the page uh, for your show, uh, they can see the upcoming uh, topics and some of the upcoming experts as well, because I think that will be important um, to be able to interact with the audience. That's right. So what would be great is if people do have questions to get in touch with me. I'm available on Twitter at Stuart Cording, for example. I'm also available on, on LinkedIn, so you can follow me there or, or, or contact me via LinkedIn or just send us an email to stuart.cording at elector.com. And 
if you've got some interest, some topic that you'd like to learn more about, then obviously we can try and schedule something around that and find expertise in that space. But also if you see something scheduled that's coming up, um, then we'd be more than happy to uh, accept some questions in advance. In fact, I've got a bit of a schedule which we can share here because oh, we've been um, really busy in the last 24 hours. Yeah. Um, pulling up some people. Let me just pull it up here. And I can say too, what's great is a couple of weeks ago, uh, you reached out to me and I believe, I believe it was even before Christmas time. And uh, we ran a bit of a poll about topics uh, that our audience is interested in. And a lot of those uh, are, are going to be listed here. Um, exactly. Yeah. So what we're going to do is kick off on uh, Wednesday, the 9th of March. Uh, yeah. Again, it's, it's always at 1600 uh, Central European time. And we've got two experts um, in the area of displays. Uh, Achim Döbler is a senior field application engineer from Actron AG. Uh, that's a company based here in, in the Munich area. Um, he is, he is a, an amazing wealth of understanding of all sorts of displays. I would say probably more in the area under 15 inches and mostly in displays that connect to, to microcontrollers. And that's an area which is, is quite challenging because microcontrollers need quite a lot of performance in order to make some reasonable type of graphical user interface. He's also developed a graphical user interface library, a lot of experience on the STM32 uh, microcontrollers, and um, regularly makes uh, lots of demos on different uh, displays to show his customers how, how to use those the best effect. And then our other guest is Alex Munden uh, from Display Technologies in the UK. Now their focus is more on industrial um, industrial displays, single board computers for driving those and displays which are enormous. These are the big displays that you would see at a um, uh, as advertising in a shopping center or in a airport or a, or a railway station. Um, they do smaller ones as well for sort of ticketing machines and things like that. And, a, and obviously another aspect of those displays today is the interaction. How do I um, press something, uh, create, um, take, create a, a touch screen and um, make sure that it works reliably and robustly in, in the open air where there's, it's exposed to the rain and wind and snow. So uh, that's going to be an interesting first uh, show. Mm -hmm. The next one, which I think is also going to be a huge, uh, have a huge amount of interest, is yeah. on Risk Five. Risk five now, yeah. This is something you and I have sort of seen regularly in the magazines, yep. uh, in the Elector magazine. It's something that uh, we discuss internally with the other engineers. With Matthias, for example, he's really keen and interested in, in Risk Five as well. Um, so Risk Five, for those who don't know, is a it's an open source, um, let's say, a processor architecture and um, it allows people to create their own um, products, microcontroller-based products, such as um, uh, in silicon or as an FPGA. But the nice thing about this particular architecture, if you compare it to commercial solutions, is really the flexibility, uh, the ability to modify and change it. Um, obviously, that's, that's a core element of all open source software. Um, but the interesting thing with RISC-V is that you can develop your own instructions to do specific things that you that are not available in the in the instruction set as it stands. And that's where Martin Kroom from Green Waves Technologies comes in. Um, he's His company has developed a processor called GAP. Uh, there's a GAP-8 and a GAP-9. And their focus has really been on enabling machine learning algorithms to be run on those processors at very, very low powers in order that you can have a battery-enabled device that can really um, run for a very long time but do some very, very complicated sensing such as um, um, vision recognition, face recognition type activities. So we'll, we'll find out from him how RISC-V has been deployed, um, how they go about creating their own al algorithms and, uh, sorry, instruction sets on, on the device. And I'm hoping to get some other tools providers in as well to talk about how you test those and make sure they work before you actually then commit them to silicon. Obviously, that's, that's yep. an important part of the process. <laughs> uh, on that note, uh, on Risk Five as well, just so everyone knows, the March and April edition uh, of Elector, we have a build your own Risk Five controller article featured in that edition. Wow. So it coincides nicely with with your show in April. That's really good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that as well. That'll be uh, an interesting one. Then we've got uh, wide band gap. Um, we're still to confirm the participants uh, for that particular show, but that will be on the 4th of May on Wednesday at 4 o'clock. 
And <clears throat> I, I don't know, um, it depends what sort of line of work you're in, I guess, what sort of engineering challenges you're facing. But uh, from what I've been seeing and the work that I get involved in, we're seeing a lot of interest in GAN and SICK in order to uh, uh, gallium nitride and silicon carbide um, power devices, MOSFETs, in order to replace things like IGBTs and silicon MOSFETs in applications such as power converters. Now, there's there's lots of advantages to using these. They're typically they're they're sort of much more efficient. They have lower lower um, on resistance, so you can save um, energy. There's not so much heat dissipation, and as a result, power supplies and power converters designed around GAN and SICK can be smaller, lighter. They generate less heat, so you can possibly get away with not using a fan. Uh, and this is really important for power supply designers, also for DC chargers for the automotive industry, for example. Uh, so there's some really interesting applications going on behind that. And that particular show is going to come out just before the PCIM event, which is running from the 10th to the uh, 12th of May. Mm -hmm. So for those that don't know PCIM, uh, PCIM is based is a show that's based here in um, Munich. Um, sorry, not in Munich, in um, Nuremberg and runs every year. And it's uh, a conference and exhibition focused on power electronics and intelligent motion, renewable energy, and also energy management. So it's a good opportunity to, to uh, uh, slide in and, and match the, uh, yeah, the visitor expectations for PCIM, as long as, of course, it goes ahead, which uh, yeah. isn't guaranteed. Right. <laughs> And then um, on the run-up to Embedded, Embedded World, World yeah. um, the show on the 8th of June on Wednesday at 4 o'clock, uh, that's still to be confirmed. But we've got some um, we've got some people lined up potentially uh, in the spare area of IoT design, uh, maybe some uh, embedded software development tools. And, of course, that's, um, as, as you see there, sort of, uh, in, in the run-up to Ed Embo Embedded Worlds 2022 running from the 21st to the 23rd of June this year. Now, um, Embedded World also takes place in Nuremberg in Germany and is focused on embedded systems, Internet of Things, solutions for e-mobility and um, energy efficiency. And what we should note there is, of course, Embedded World was is typically runs in February yeah. and has already been delayed um, uh, because of the COVID rules here in Germany, which would have sort of restricted attendance, especially from abroad, it made it more difficult. So, um, yeah, so we're seeing already the impact of, of COVID here. And again, sort of come back to the point why we're doing this. Our concern is, you know, that the, the, the interaction is, is being restricted um, very much at the moment. So uh, we desperately need these sort of uh, live streams and shows uh, to, to bring professional engineers in an open forum, in a, in a chat environment to talk about these things and, uh, yeah, and help everybody out. Well, I'm super excited that, that you're doing that with us. Um, and I think it will be very useful whether these shows go on or not. Um, exactly. Yeah. Know, definitely. Uh, uh, hope, hopefully, in better world will happen though, because that will be great. Yeah. Exactly. No, I think um, for me personally, and many other people that I regularly meet at these shows, I mean, we're just really disappointed that the the shows don't go ahead. Um, on the one side, it's it's about catching up with old colleagues and and friends, uh, but also have an opportunity to physically see the uh, products on display and talk to the engineers who develop yeah. the demonstrations. And um, it, it just gives you an idea of what's possible, opens up new opportunities for, for developing new products. And uh, without that personal interaction, um, it really it really doesn't work. You know, the, on, the online shows um, that have been offered really don't uh, cut it in comparison, which is which is upsetting, you know, that, uh, that you know, we haven't found a solution to really yeah. provide the same experience, you know. I do. Well, great. Super. Good stuff. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Oh, sorry, I've lost you there. Oh, <laughs> you it's okay. For a second. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we're still learning how this works with this live. That's okay. Season. We're we're very excited uh, uh, on our end, of course, and uh, you know we look forward to your next show. Super. Thanks very much. So Thanks, we'll say, say goodbye for now, and uh, we're going to move on to take a look at uh, what else Elector does in between the shows. So. 
Um, for a long time, Elector magazine has had a supplement magazine called Elector Industry. And this year, we've decided to integrate Elector Industry into the main magazine. And the reason for doing that is quite simply that a large proportion of our readership are professional engineers. They work on uh, in engineering organizations on a daily basis. They're developing products. And one of the attractions of Elector as a magazine is the combination of, of hobby and maker projects combined with the industry news and the industry insights that uh, people like myself are allowed to contribute to the magazine. So what I wanted to do was just take a look back at some of the things we've covered in the last uh, 12 months to give you an idea of the types of um, articles that we, um, that we cover in the magazine and, and perhaps uh, give you some food for thought as to what type of topics that you might be interested in um, have seeing in the show and, and uh, recommending and showing to us, uh, suggesting to us in the, the coming weeks and months. So um, obviously one of the biggest things that's happened in the last 12 months is the um, corona pandemic and the impact that that has on the delivery or the lack of delivery of semiconductors and other components uh, for the electronics industry at large. So we went out and we talked to uh, sort of research some of the, the causes of that, some of the background associated with that, um, and uh, talked to many people, many of my old colleagues actually in the industry helped me out telling me sort of what was going on and what the real challenges were and, and how they were uh, tackling those. So that was uh, very helpful uh, to everybody that, that gave, us, uh, gave us a hand there. But essentially what happened back last year as Corona um, broke out was obviously everybody was working from home. A lot of the um, manufacturing sites for everything had to close in order to allow the, the pandemic um, to be brought under control. And because of that, many industries, and one of the ones that sticks out um, is the automotive industry, they cancelled their orders for chips that were supposed to be going into their products. Um, now, at the same time, because lots of people working from home, suddenly there was a lot of interest in additional tablets, uh, computer monitors, mice, keyboards, um, webcams, et cetera, et cetera. And so the manufacturers of sort of consumer goods and PC peripherals went out to the semiconductor industry and say, hey, we need some more chips. So the capacity that was made was freed up by industrial purchases and, and automotive purchases uh, was filled then by uh, consumer goods um, um, purchases. So around six months later, the, 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 the pandemic was more under control. It was clear that uh, the automotive industry could start manufacturing vehicles again. But by then, six months had passed and all the capacity had been taken. So uh, one of the things many people perhaps don't appreciate is that when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing, semiconductors take a very long time to be manufactured. Um, a single chip can take up to six months from start to packaging and test uh, before it can, can actually be then put in a, in a tape and reel and sent to a manufacturing facility to be put on a printed circuit board. Um, so if you're placing an order today, you're not gonna see anything for six months and that's if there's any capacity available um, at all. So the result of this was that we've seen lots of, in the automotive industry, lots of cars being placed in parking lots. Uh, they're sitting there sometimes with um, some features um, completely missing and then being sold with certain ECUs actually not part of the package. Uh, in other cases, the, um, the vehicles are just sitting there waiting because there, there are no parts to, to implement important parts of the car. So they're just sitting there almost finished um, waiting for whenever the, the missing chips and other uh, components are going to be um, delivered. What this has sort of thrown up is the importance of forecasting. And I think with large organizations, obviously the purchasing teams, that's all a, a lot more under control, but it, it's the small and medium-sized businesses that have probably struggled the most because they maybe buy in smaller quantities of, of, of hundreds and thousands, maybe um, a month. And obviously they have a, a very, very tiny um, business with a, a particular semiconductor vendor that probably purchased through some third party like a distributor. And so, you know, if, if they're stuck and can't manufacture anything, they really don't have a voice to be able to go out there and, and convince people that, you know, why they should have priority over somebody else um, who's obviously buying millions of parts per month. So um, in, forecasting is an important thing 
Um, for example, uh, Steve Sangi from Microchip Technology, in one of his reg regular open letters, he announced that there's going to be a preferred supplier program. And for people or companies offering a 12-month uncancelable, uncancelable backlog, um, they would sort of get some preferential treatment when it comes to um, delivery of parts when they become uh, available. And that is sort of really essential, obviously, if, if you need three to six months to manufacture or something, you really need to have a very good feel for how many of those you're actually going to sell. Um, Infineon as well, there was a, an interview on, I think it was on CNBC with uh, Reinhard Ploss uh, from Infineon. And uh, he basically said that he'd never seen anything like the state uh, that we were in today. Um, even the, the mobile phone boom of the um, of the early 2000s was, was nowhere near as challenging as the um, as the situation that, uh, that they were finding themselves in with uh, with delivery issues. And I also had the uh, the opportunity to talk to Asif Chowdhury uh, from uh, UTAC. UTAC is a uh, chip assembly and test um, um, cut supplier. So they receive the dyes from uh, silicon manufacturers and they put them into the packaging with the, the metal legs or the um, or the balls and place the package around uh, plastic packaging around them. And um, what he was saying that uh, basically we're just continuously on the telephone trying to resolve uh, delivery issues. Um, the issues also were with run of the mill packages. So SOIC, QFM packages were the issue. And for the uh, lead frame, so that's the, the metal the metal part of the package which forms the pins, he was saying that the, some of the some of their uh, lead frame suppliers were simply not accepting any new orders and there were lead times of, of up to 12 weeks. So when we wrap all that information up, it's helpful to sort of have a feeling of, of what can we do? And, and this, is, um, this, this recommendation has also come from talking to people over the last 12 months in, in the industry. And one of the most important things is uh, to make sure you build up uh, supplier relationships. Um, oftentimes, you know, uh, there's a there's a there's a discussion and fight about pricing, um, and um, these these supplier relationships can be very transactional. I need some parts. We order the parts. Uh, we expect them to arrive in a, in a week or so. But it's it's definitely worth um, I think now bearing in mind what's happened over the last uh, 20, 12 to twenty four months is looking how you can build up your supplier relationships and improve them. Um, and also make sure that you can, as far as possible, share forecasts about what it is that you, you need. Uh, there's definitely um, parts of the world, um, especially in automotive, uh, we've seen that with, um, I think it was with Toyota, um, part of their sort of um, just-in-time manufacturing process has sort of been put to one side and, and while, rather than just hope uh, plan that everything arrives on the day when it's needed, um, they're actually still starting to build up some stock of 30, I think it was 30 to 60 days uh, to make sure that they don't go short of critical semiconductors for their uh, for their vehicles. So um, even the big guys are, are taking a step back and um, rather than focus on, on um, optimizations and, and cost downs, uh, they're actually taking a step back and saying, hey, well, actually um, availability <laughs> is an important part of, of um, how everything works. And uh, we've sort of uh, ignored that for a while. So we're bringing that back in to make sure that uh, we stay on top of that. Um, another recent article that we looked at was on motor control. Now, I think it's quite interesting. You get perhaps the feeling when you go to an exhibition that uh, motor control is very much focused on replacing brushed DC motors and moving on to brushless DC motors and, and permanent magnet synchronous motors in order to attain all of the um, power efficiencies that those offer um, to reduce the heat generation, um, reduce power consumption, and so on and so forth. But um, the reality is uh, still that there's many, many fractional horsepower DC brush motors in use today. And the control of those, um, an example would be the, uh, the wing mirrors of a, of a car, for example, so that the mirrors can be controlled and, and um, uh, the angle can be changed. Um, and the, um, you know, because they're so common, the semiconductor industry has uh, responded with lots of different um, into highly integrated H bridges, which make it much, much easier to control those fractional horsepower DC motors. Those sort of devices, uh, if you look around, they're not just um, 
include the, the, the MOSFETs that you need to create the H-bridge, but they also include lots of diagnostics and protection. So for example, um, should it overheat if there's short circuits and so on and so forth, um, the protection kicks in to protect the, the part and also the rest of the circuit. And uh, via interfaces like SPI, it's possible then to draw out uh, diagnostic information, which can be uh, evaluated by a microcontroller and then fed back in into the larger system. Another interesting aspect of, of motor control is, is trying to implement the, the actual control algorithm. And um, PID algorithms are often used. But the challenge with the, the PID algorithm is it is relatively uh, software intensive, um, processor intensive to Im implement. So if you're looking at cheaper 8-bit microcontrollers to reach a specific, specific price point for your application, um, you may find that there's not enough performance there to calculate the, the PID control loop in a, in a reasonable time frame in order to provide the, the, the control that you need for your application. Uh, so what was interesting was uh, looking around on the market, what's there today, uh, the PIC16F1619, uh, for example, the, that's a microcontroller that actually integrates a hardware PID controller. And by once, once it's been set up, um, it, it's possible with that particular hardware module to execute a PID loop in nine clock cycles um, rather than the thousand or more clock cycles it would require to do the same thing in software. So even in that space of, of DC motor control, which is uh, relatively simple and, and easy to implement, um, there's still uh, advancements and uh, developments going on to improve um, the microcontroller solutions out there on the market. On the brushless DC side and, and permanent magnet synchronous motor side, obviously there's lots going on there as well to try and um, simplify the control of those motors and, and make it easier to bring um, products to market. And one of the, the microcontrollers we looked at in the article there was the Toshiba TXZ4A+. Now that particular microcontroller is an ARM Cortex-based microcontroller, but it also integrates what they call their vector engine. And that vector engine implements the entire park, Clark Park um, algorithm in hardware. It links also to the AT converter and also to the PWM module. And once it's set up, it's almost independent. It requires just a sort of an interrupt every so often to, to keep it up to date. But essentially, the, the whole algorithm, the field-oriented control algorithm is, is uh, implemented in hardware. And that means that the microcontroller can then be used to focus on other parts of the application and, and simplifies the whole implementation. Someone else we spoke to was uh, Jonas Proger from Trinamic, which is now part of Analog Devices. And they're well known for their um, motor control uh, devices and, and silicon. And what he was saying that um, the control loops today are operating at much, much higher frequencies than in the past, sometimes up to 100 kilohertz. And that type of um, fast control loop actually needs a DSP or an FPGA to implement it normally. Uh, but devices that they have in their portfolio, something like the, the TMC4671, that can actually handle that with dedicated hardware. And that makes it obviously, again, easier to implement. It brings the cost down, brings the, the number of devices down to implement your application. Another focus of the industry today, he was telling us as well, was about the reduction of audible noise from um, motors such as servo motors. Um, and so the, there's a drive to almost silent operation and there's a, there's a big market looking at how they can reduce the audible noise. So what they have integrated into some of their parts is a, a voltage chopping technique uh, which they use. And that helps to reduce the audible noise by 10 decibels uh, in stepper motors. So that's, uh, that's what the motor control article covers. If you've just joined us, uh, you're here with uh, Stuart Cording in the Elector Engineering Insights live stream. This is our regular live stream that goes out on Wednesdays around every month. And we're just taking a review of the articles that have been covered uh, by the industry team here at uh, Elector over the past uh, 12 months. Another interesting article, which I think is um, brings together lots of different pieces of um, uh, manufacturing, industrial space, and, and machine learning was our article on um, moving from preventative maintenance towards predictive maintenance. 
one of the interesting things was in researching the background of this was that um, many uh, continuous improvement programs have really reached the limits of what they can do. So continuous improvement programs focus on sort of finding problems, uh, working as a team to resolve that issue and then implementing the improvements to avoid uh, that issue occurring again, which, which might result in some sort of uh, quality defect in, in whatever it is you're manufacturing. One of the examples we looked at was a bulb manufacturer, Osram, who are manufacturing uh, lamps for the automotive industry. And one of the big challenges that they were seeing was precisely that, that um, you know, if, if they were going to make any more improvements, the improve, to Im implement the improvements was going to cost a lot of money, much more than they were going to end up um, in, in savings. But the improvements were still there to be made. So was there something that they could do in order to sort of still make uh, the improvements they wanted to, but maybe in a bit more coordinated fashion? And one of the um, one, one of the interesting things there is is to see how they can use machine learning um, can uh, on top of the existing industrial IoT manufacturing platforms that they have in place. So with industrial IoT, most of the machinery in a in a factory is all already connected with one another and to a, a central computers that collect all the data regarding the manufacturing process, regarding temperatures in ovens and pressures. Um, the speed of motors, um, maybe power consumption, and all of that can be analyzed using machine learning al algorithms to, to predict at what point a particular part of the process may fail or is at risk of failing. And the idea, obviously, is to see in advance that maybe a, a furnace is, 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 um, it has a problem and to then send an engineer to examine that before the furnace actually fails and, and maybe falls out for several hours um, because of that. This challenge uh, is, is known as the remake, calculating the remaining useful life, or RUL, um, which we use to determine when something's going to fail. Now, one of the interesting things about this, um, about all machine learning, is, is the fact that you need huge quantities of data in order to um, develop these algorithms and, and bring them to market and, and use them and implement them usefully. So, but the, the issue is with, with lots of environments, you're measuring and collecting data on something that's actually working and you don't actually have the data uh, to see um, when, it's, uh, when it fails, it's, it fails now and you've got a, a very small amount of failure data to go on. So um, organizations such as NASA, for example, they have been collecting data on turbofan engines. Now, these aerospace engines uh, are fitted out with many, many sensors, and they're continuously monitored, and the data is collected in order to assess the, uh, um, the functionality of the motor um, when it's being repaired. Uh, they can then look at the data and, and see what, what, what could possibly go wrong. And not only have they collected the data of the turbofan, they've also um, collected it right up to the point where the turbofan failed. And the interesting thing there is, is that you can then go through that and data and analyze it and develop a predictive algorithm, uh, which is capable of saying, mm, in, inside the next, say, 30 days, um, it looks like this, this, um, this engine will fail. And therefore, now is the right time to, to go ahead and, and maybe service it. And potentially, this is what we think the, the problem could be. So we found a Munich-based business called Double Slash, and they'd actually developed a prediction algorithm based upon this data uh, from NASA. And it was interesting to see that um, they, their algorithm managed to collect, correctly predict uh, on 63 occasions a pending that a pending failure would occur in the next 30 days. Um, it also predicted incorrectly that a failure would occur in, uh, on 12 occasions. Um, but the probably the most important part of that uh, project was the fact that it, it didn't miss a failure. So um, there was no case where a failure would have occurred, which was un remained undetected. So it shows that um, the predictive failure technology and um, machine learning to achieve that is possible. Uh, obviously requires a lot of research and work and analysis and data to do that. But uh, it's an area that um, is current and, and uh, under development. There was also another project from the Fraunhofer Institute called AIFES, and they've developed uh, a C-based uh, C language library for microcontrollers to implement uh, again machine learning technology. And I think this is this is one of the challenges that uh, we're all 
groups facing in the industry at the minute is this, this uh, question of where we implement our machine learning and how we implement it. Obviously, some machine learning needs to be needs to occur at the edge because that is where the sensor and also the actuator are actually implemented. So, uh, for example, in a motor control system, if we are able to detect a pending failure, then we actually need to turn the motor off immediately in order to avoid some sort of um, failure occurring or damage to the equipment or even uh, injury to personnel who are working in, in the area. So it's people are trying to avoid moving the data to a cloud-based machine learning um, algorithm because the latency of that may not be fast enough um, to ensure that safety can be um, guaranteed. So the project from the Fraunhofer Institute, what they showed was that um, not only could they create a, a very small footprint um, C language based um, machine learning library, um, which was good for gesture recognition, also for handwriting recognition. It also was capable of supporting, um, of actually being trained on the microcontroller. And that means that um, you don't need additional resources, say a separate uh, high power processor or even a cloud-based um, machine learning algorithm in order to train the algorithm and get it ready. So that's uh, an overview of the types of um, articles that we um, cover here at Elector. Uh, if you'd like to see any more of those, you can see all of the elect uh, Elector articles that I write at ttcr.at slash Stuart at Elector. There's a list of uh, the articles that we write for the Elector magazine. So some are more focused on, on the hobby community. Um, some are more background pieces and others are focused more on, on the industrial space like our show here today. So you're watching the Elector Engineering Insights show. This is our inaugural show and it's slowly coming to the end. I'd like to thank everybody to, um, for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the show and you've developed a feeling for what to expect in the future. You've seen also uh, some of the topics that we are planning to cover and some of the guests we're planning to have on. And if you'd like to join us as a guest, um, why not get in touch with us by email, via Twitter, or you can reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. And if you'd like to see what's on the upcoming schedule, everything will be updated regularly on the Elector Engineering Insights page, and that's available at ttcr.at slash ei. So drop by, take a look, and you'll find everything that you need there, and also uh, access to all of the other articles uh, that I contribute to the Elector um, magazine. So thanks very much for joining us today. Stay in touch, and don't forget to keep asking us your engineering questions, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.